I don't know if, oh, it's on now. <laughs> it's good to see you. Folks, did they make you guys the cootie section or something to make you sit over there where everybody else is? There? <laughs> Folks, it's a blessing to be here. I thoroughly enjoy just fellowshipping with God's people across the state of Michigan. Now, I must confess, I'm originally from the state down south and a little bit to the east. Uh, you all know it as O-H-I-O. <laughs> oh, hey, all right. <clears throat> But it's a blessing to be here with you. I love Michigan. I really do. Uh, other than though the universities there, I love the uh, <laughs> I love the state of Michigan. As a matter of fact, I was sharing with the dear woman here that my wife and I both have roots in Michigan. Her mother was born in Jackson, Michigan, and uh, grew up. As a matter of fact, her godmother was James Earl Jones's mother. And so we got a chance one day in Cleveland. I guess we had been married for about two or three years. And we went, he was doing a play in Cleveland. We were living at Akron at the time. And so we went up and we, we after the play, we literally went to the stage door and knocked on the backstage door and, and said, can we see James Earl Jones? And believe it or not, he came out. And the first thing that happened when he came out is my wife shows him this picture of his mother. And he says, and I quote, where did you get a picture of my mother? <laughs> What a great time, but she, uh, her mother grew up in that area, a lot of relatives here. My grandmother grew up in Detroit, and so I have a lot of relatives over there, but they all ended up in Akron, Ohio, and it was God's plan for her to be in Akron. My dad grew up, he was born in Virginia, my mother in Birmingham, Alabama, but they ended up in Akron, and all of that happened because God knew that I needed to marry Sharon. So there it is, but it's a blessing to be here with you. I have the greatest respect for your pastor, and I haven't met all of you. I've, I've known some. I know Ben, uh, Pastor Ben, and I've met uh, some of the messers because they sing at our uh, GA meeting just about every year, and I was blessed by the worship this morning. I don't know about you, but was the worship great or what? <laughs> Amen. But really, bless, this is a beautiful facility. I mean, I'd love to be able to take it with me and just kind of plant it in each city that we have around Michigan that needs a place like this and the facilities that you have. I'm blessed because your church is concerned about bringing Christ to the community. You know, with the community center, the ministries you do, the outreach is just tremendous. And keep it up because God is doing something uh, through your church. And so it's a blessing to be able to honor you in that. But want to take the time now to go to the Word. They showed me the list of service, and it said 25 minutes for the sermon. Now, I warn you in advance, I'm a black preacher. <laughs> I'm used to folks talking back to me. But I also know that for a black preacher, 25 minutes means that you're checking your watch at about 3 o'clock and saying, are we done yet? <laughs> uh, I won't preach that long. I'll keep it down to two hours, but. My wife will also tell you I am a bona fide silly willy, and so every once in a while I'm going to say something, hopefully that will have you laughing a little bit, because the Word of God is serious stuff, but it's also fun too. Scripture says that a merry heart does good like a medicine, and so I like to uh, share the Word of God, and I can share a serious word, but every once in a while throw in something that will have you laughing a little bit too, I hope. And if you don't know how to laugh on cue, I'll say laugh, and it's time to laugh. I want to direct your attention to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, and I think they'll have it on the screen. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, you mean you came to church without your Bible. What's up with that? I guess we've reached that age where we have smartphones now, so you don't need to carry a big, heavy Bible, you know, to look super religious. You can have your cell phone, and you say, I've got my 75 versions of my Bible, but pardon me while I play a little word for you while I'm doing that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, and I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. Immediately after this, Jesus ins uh, insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross the lake to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. 
about three in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it is a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. I want to share with you from the topic, there's an app for that. There's an app for that. You know, life brings us many challenges and difficulties. Things that are hard to process and hard to overcome. Any of us have any difficulties or troubles? Okay, black preacher, talk back, you know, at least raise a hand, you know, wink an eyebrow, wiggle a pinky toe, do something so that I know you're here. But difficulties, if you haven't had any, see me afterwards. I'll let you borrow you a couple of mine. And you can, okay. But life brings stuff at you, doesn't it? Sometimes we cause it, sometimes others cause it to us, but sometimes things just happen, and they happen to all of us. Some are life-changing, some aren't, but they certainly affect us in profound ways that cause us to have to cope with them or deal with them. And guess what? The devil loves to use all of these things to affect us and our families, and he does them in some crazy ways, but he does them in our families, he does it in our churches, he does it in our communities. You know, we look around at this crazy world we're in, and it's obvious his hand is just about everywhere you turn. A lot of tricks and a lot of traps, but, you know, I've, I've learned how to just put those things into proper perspective and the proper classification. I call them the devil's derailers, and I literally expect that he might be trying to use any or all of them on me or anybody that I know at any particular time, and so that helps me to be armed and prepared for what he's going to do. But let me just read a few of these devil's derailers, and they all start with D. That's, you know, we preachers, we, we like to keep things close so that you can, you know, uh, they're all D's, so everybody remembers that, you know, and I say everybody, I mean, I remember that, so, you know, but anyway, things like devastation, distraction, disappointment, discouragement, depression, devaluation, duplicity, disruption, doubt. Anybody experience any of those? No, whenever you experience those, that the devil is at work. Sure signs that he's around. As I look at these derailers, and we certainly have experienced many of those in our lives over the past several years in particular, I encourage you today that there literally is an app for that. Who here has smartphones? Who doesn't have a smartphone? Okay. That's okay. That's all right. As long as you have a phone. Nowadays, you have to have a phone. You know, just about anywhere you go. I don't know. I've gotten to the point now. I've had a cell phone for so long. If I don't have it, I can get three miles from home and say, oh, I left my phone at home. Turn around and go back and get it because I just feel exposed if I don't have my phone, you know. But there's an app for all of these things. You have it on your phone. You have it on your tablet. Just about anything you want to do nowadays, you know, you have an app for it. You can just go out to your app store and bring it down on your smartphone or on your tablet and utilize that for whatever it is you need. You know, if you're looking for uh, items that are on sale at, the, at Kroger, you know, or Meyer, you can just go to their app and look, and they'll show you what their latest coupons are and their latest uh, flyer is. Or if you're looking for seats to go to the movies or whatever, you can bring up a movie app, and boom, it's right there. Everything you need is right there at your fingertips. Well... Life can be like that as well if you have the app that works for the devil's derailers and for life's, life's experiences. I love this theme that you're doing, Encounters with Jesus, because you know, we all have those, and we should. 
have them daily in our lives. But there's a number of storms that just kind of come across the land. Just look over the last couple of years. I don't know if you've noticed it, but I kind of pay attention to that because I think about scriptures that says when you see these kinds of things happening, you'll know you're in the end times. You know, we're in those last days. I don't know how long they'll last, but when you look at the circumstances that are going on, you know that we're in the last days. But just look at the the natural disaster type things that are going on around us, you know, snowstorms. You know, I, I'm glad I don't live in the New England states because it seems like every week they're getting hit by a snowstorm. Uh, Michigan, this was probably, I've been here for three winters now. This year was the first time we had real winter and it was real winter. I'll be so happy that, what is it, tomorrow or Tuesday is spring, you know, and, and I'm hoping that someone will tell the weatherman that it is spring. But you know, snowstorms, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis. J J Japanese people right now are afraid they're going to have a tsunami because they keep having these big earthquakes. And the last time they had an earthquake like the ones they had the last couple of weeks, they had a tsunami that wiped out part of a major city. Volcanoes, eruptions. How about the fires that are on the West Coast and in Colorado burning up millions of acres of property and billions of dollars worth of people's homes and things? But these storms that have ravaged the landscapes and then, you know, the, the social storms, you know, just think about all the crazy stuff that's going on in the culture, you know, but many of those things happen in nature and the social storms. But what about those that hit us personally? You know, when the storms come into our lives, back in 2002, I was pastoring, I was in the fifth year, you know, working on the sixth year of the first church that I pastored. Because when I graduated from college, I spent 20 years in the computer industry selling uh, computer systems to large companies. And when I started pastoring this church in Pittsburgh, it was the hardest five years of my life because I learned every day what I didn't know about pastoring. And so I reached a place in the fifth year where there was a group of people that just really didn't want me around. And so they started a little thing, and it came against me. Well, in June 30th of that year, I ended up resigning from that church. That was a tough time. But on June 1st, I'll never forget that day. Well, I should stop saying that because I might forget that day. I still remember to this day that day. I'm preaching a funeral for a Jamaican man in Pittsburgh by the name of Roy Austin. I didn't know him, but people, I had several Jamaican people in my church, and they were, he was a friend of theirs, and so they asked if I would do his funeral. So I'm preaching his funeral at the funeral home. He had died of a massive heart attack suddenly. And I remember preaching that funeral, and as I was sharing with that, the people that were gathered, his family, you know, the compassion that I had because I didn't know what it was like to lose someone like that so suddenly. And so we were talking about that, and that was part of my eulogy for that service. Well, I'm at the graveyard, and we do the committal, and you know, I will tell you something about Jamaican people. I don't know what it is, but they will not leave the graveyard until everything is done. And so, you know, you're, normally I'll do a committal service, and we hop in the car and go home, and then the people at the graveyard will take care of processing the cat. These folks will stand there, and they say, I want you to put it in the ground. I want you to take everything off it now. Start putting the dirt back on. They're not leaving until it's done, right? So I'm standing there just kind of waiting, and I happen to look, pick up my smartphone, you know, and look and see my sister had called me, my sister Kathy, and and I know, okay, my sister doesn't always call me too often unless the Browns are playing or the Indians or the, or excuse me, the Guardians or the Cavaliers and something has happened. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is June, so football's not going on. The Cavaliers were terrible this year because LeBron left. And, you know, the, 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 my tribe at the time, they were the Indians at the time, were not very good. And so something's going on. So she called me and she said, Mark, I'd have to tell you that mom passed away. And literally, about the same time I was saying to this family, I don't know what it's like to lose someone so suddenly, like with a heart attack. And at that almost exact same moment I said that, my mother died of a heart attack. Instantly gone. Two years later, my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. 
And he was, a, I mean, he, you talking about fighting a good fight. He was all the way till the day we put him in hospice. He was taking care of business and doing his thing while you know, cancer was ravaging his body. And he passed away. So within two years, the people who had shaped my life and been that foundation and, and encouragement, you know, along with my wife, because I'd been married for a while, but they were the foundation of my upbringing and everything else. They were gone. And so you got to deal with this. I would imagine every one of you would have at least one story that you could tell of how life has impacted you, maybe more than one. Sometimes we have situations where several things hit me. Remember what I said? I resigned on the 30th of June. My mother died 29 days before that. But I was in the middle of all of this confusion and everything going on. So sometimes life can heap things on you. Sometimes all at the same time. And you have to deal with it. But folks, there's an app for that. None of us are immune from it. From the devil's derailers or just life situations. Because we live in a sinful and in a fallen world. It's just the realities of this world that we're in. And a lot of times, you can't plan for it. You know, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, my parents are going to die today. You just can't plan for some of these things. You know, sometimes you, you might go into work, everything is fine, and they announce, hey, they're shutting the factory down. And you got to do something else because everybody's going to be let go at the end of the month. You can't play for that. Things happen, and you just have to deal with it. Now, there's an old worldly axiom that says time heals all wounds. Not really, <laughs> okay? Time helps because it gives you the perspective of being able to look at back on it and just kind of put it all in some kind of perspective. But let's face it, time doesn't heal the wounds. It takes intentional effort on our part, and it takes direct guidance, help, and encouragement from God to heal the wounds of the things that happen in our lives. But there's an app for that. The scripture that we see today, it kind of picks up. It's the second half of a miraculous story. Because there's a lot of stuff going on up until this time. If you read it before you get to that part of this chapter, you'll see that it talks about what Jesus is doing. And his disciples and Jesus are going through the countryside there, and they're doing all kinds of powerful and miraculous stuff. Jesus has several encounters with the Jewish leaders, and he's taking them to task for not leading God's people the way they should. But then after all of that, the news that John the Baptist had been killed was told to them. And it was devastating to them. It was devastating to Jesus for a number of reasons. First of all, John was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the one that was supposed to come and trumpet the coming of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. But also, John was his cousin. And so there was some, some pain there and some hurt. And the disciples were affected by that. As a matter of fact, two of Jesus' disciples were John's disciples that came to follow Jesus. And so this news reaches him. And so Jesus says, let's go to a solitary place. And so they hop in the boat and they're going. Now, when they're on the boat, you know, you need to understand that this big, huge crowd is following Jesus. So they hop in the boat to go. But the crowd could look out on the lake and see where they're going. So the crowd is following them along the shore as they're on the lake. And so they try to get into a solitary place. And as soon as they get there ready to rest and relax, here comes the crowd. And this big, huge, massive crowd. And the scripture says, not only here, but in one of the other gospel translations, it says, and Jesus looked upon them with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them and he began to preach to them and began to heal them and do all kinds of things with the crowd and he had been with them all day long now this is after they had been doing all kinds of stuff and they got this heavy news and they were tired and they were wanted to rest and retool and recuperate but now here's this crowd of thousands of people to deal with so he's there preaching teaching healing all day long and it's getting to be dark now. And so the disciples say, well, Lord, why don't you send them away so that they can find something to eat? Because it's getting late in the day and they haven't eaten all day. And Jesus said, you should feed them. They're thinking, well, you know, Lord, you're, we're not, this isn't mire in the desert. 
You know, we don't know what we're going to feed them. And they say, well, what do you have? And they found out, and one of the other uh, Gospels tells us that there was a boy there that had five loaves of bread and two fish. And, and so he said, well, bring them here. And he began to bless them and break them and distribute them. And by the way, there's a sermon in that for the church uh, called God's Math. In other words, do God's math with the church. You, you just keep doing division until it turns into multiplication. Jesus kept breaking bread and fish and handing them out. And 5,000 men plus women and children were fed with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they carried 12 baskets of leftovers from that. Wow. If you ever want to do something in the church, just start doing division until it turns into multiplication. I'm not talking about dividing the congregation. I'm talking about taking your resources and handing them out and watch how God just re replenishes those. But I didn't come to preach a financial sermon today. But if you want to give, you know, just bring it up and hand it to her. She'll make sure it makes it into the collection plate. But anyway, so they do that. So all these people are fed. And then Jesus tells the disciples, get back into the boat and go back across the lake to the other side. What they didn't know is he was sending them over to the region of the Gadarenes because there was a crazy guy over there that needed to be transformed so that he could become a preacher. Okay. So anyway, they get on the boat. And while they're in the boat, this storm creeps up out of nowhere. And I mean, it's a massive storm. And they're afraid for their lives. And they are literally rowing all night long and getting nowhere. You ever been there? Doing everything you can. You're giving it your best effort. And you're exactly where you started. And you're like, what in the world is going on? Anyway, while they're doing that, Jesus just kind of goes up by himself. And he's there with the Father praying. Now, he sent the crowd away. He sent the disciples away while it was dusk. So let's say it was maybe six or seven. Here he is in the third watch, fourth watch of the night. So anywhere, somewhere between three and six o'clock in the morning. Because the first watch is six to nine. Nine to twelve is the second watch. Midnight to three is the third watch. So somewhere between three and four in the morning... Jesus comes walking across the stormy water to the disciples and they see this and they yell out, it's a ghost because we're about to die. <laughs> and some of these guys were fishermen. They'd been on this lake before when it was rough like that, but it was so bad and they're rowing so hard just to stay alive and try to keep going that they thought it was all over. And here comes Jesus walking on the water towards them. And it's a ghost. And so the Lord says, no, it's me. And then Peter calls out and says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come on the water. Folks, as we look at this story and we think about the events that happened, and you know that, as I said when I started, there's an app for that stuff that affects us in life. We want to talk about that because there are three features to this app that are absolutely tremendous. And they work for everyone who will name the name of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. Three great features. The first of them is Jesus himself. Jesus in the midst of our lives. If you're walking with Jesus, he's promised he will never leave us or forsake us. And that he would be with us even to the end of the age. So Jesus in the midst. So they dealt, you know, he dealt with the news of John the Baptist. Hey, it's time to pull off and rest. He dealt with the crowd. He fed them spiritually and physically. And then sent them off. And then he fed his own spirit spiritually. He sends them to the other side of the lake. And then he knows. Now Jesus knew that they were going to have to face a storm. He knew that tough times were coming. And there's a reason why he always allowed them to experience some things. Because Jesus knew at some point in time. He was going to be back in heaven. And they were going to have to deal with taking the gospel to the world. And so he wanted them to be able to face some tough stuff because he knew that just about all of them, 11 of, well, 10 of the 12, were going to have to face persecution and be killed for their faith. Judas took his own life, but John ended up not being persecuted for his faith with death, although he faced plenty of persecution. So he knew they were going to face some tough times, so he has an experience here for them to face it. And so they're out there on the water and they're dealing with this storm, but he's spending time with God in prayer. Isn't that a powerful lesson? 
Always be in prayer. Always be walking with the Lord. It doesn't mean that you have to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week on your knees. But what it does mean is you're going through the day and you're having this conversation with the Lord who is living within you through the presence of the Holy Spirit and you're talking to God all day long. Don't worry about folks if you see you in the store and it looks like you're talking to yourself. You know, just put your cell phone thing in your ear and act like you're talking on your phone and nobody will say a thing. They don't need to know you're talking to Jesus instead of, you know, somebody on the phone. But anyway, they're out there in the storm. Jesus is talking to God and then he comes walking on the water to God and then they cry out, it's a ghost. And then they're, they're totally terrified by this time. And so he says, no, don't be afraid. It's me. And Peter says, if it's you, Lord, let me come out. So Jesus wants us to know something about this. First of all, he wanted them to know that you're not going to die. Why? Because you were created to be apostles. I've got something for you. So you're not going to die in this storm. You're going to face it. You're going to make it through the storm. But you aren't here to die in this storm. I didn't send you out to kill you. I sent you out to test you, to develop you, to strengthen you. But you're going to make it through this storm. And Jesus wants to, us to know that regardless of what's going on in your life, you can make it through the storm because he's got something better for you. He's got a purpose in your life. He made you with a purpose. David said, you saw me in my unformed substance before you knit me together in my mother's womb. He told Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you. And before you were born, I had already consecrated you to be my prophet to the nations. Folks, God could just as easily say to you, Ben, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I had already set you apart to be a youth pastor in Alma. Because I got some youth there that need what I put in you. Every single one of us. God has a special purpose for you, or you wouldn't be here. Doesn't matter how young or old you are, there's a purpose in your life. And because of that, even the storms you go through will not defeat you because God has a purpose. Even in suffering sometimes. Suffering, sickness may take you out of this world, but even in the midst of that, God's got a plan and a purpose, and something happens because of that in the lives of others. And so they weren't going to die, and he wanted them to know that, but he wants us to know it. The stuff we go through is not going to defeat you. Because even if cancer takes you out of this world, guess what? You're still going to be with the Lord in glory for eternity with a brand new body to worship at his throne forever. You're not going to be defeated by anything that the world and certainly anything that the devil has will not defeat you and will not blunt the purpose of God if you're faithful and steadfast. As Paul said in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keep stepping, keep working on it, because God has a plan, and he wants us to know something. And first of all, he is with us. Whenever God is in you, God is with you. And so you don't have to worry about being alone. Even if you don't see anybody else around you, know that God is with you. He's in the midst and he's working in and for and through you so that you can fulfill the plan. He also wants us to know that every moment of our lives, he is ever living to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father according to the will of God. So as you are sitting here right now and trying to wrestle through what this chubby preacher from Lansing is talking about, you must know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, but you also need to know while he's up there doing that, the scripture tells us in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us uh, with prayers and groanings that we can't understand even when we don't know how to pray. So you've got a connection between earth and heaven that is always divinely interceding for us to bring forth the will of God that was put in us from the start because there's an app for that. So he wants us to not be afraid even when things seem overwhelming and devastating to us. 
Don't be afraid because there's nothing that happens to us, nothing that comes our way that has God sitting on the throne of heaven, wringing his hand saying, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. God knew what you were going to face in your life even before you were born. Right there in Psalm 139 again, verse 16, it says, Every day of my life was written in your book before one of them was spent. You know, God knew that when you were born, before you were born, that on March, what day is it? March 20th? Whew, man, these days are going by fast. March 20th, 2022, he knew you'd be sitting here listening to this Ohio State Buckeye, Cleveland Brown fan shouting at you. And he knew that if you just endure, it'll be over soon. <laughs> But he wants us to know that no matter how big the storm, he rules over the storm. Whatever you're going through, he rules over your storm. So understand that the first feature of this app that is ours is Jesus in the midst. The second feature of this app is the boldness and faith. The boldness and faith. Peter, I love Peter. He is about as impetuous as you could be, you know. He'll jump out in a second and do something. So when he hears that it's the Lord, he says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come walking on the water to you. Hey, come on out. The water's fine. So Peter didn't even give it a second thought, hops out of the boat, starts walking across the water, and everything is fine as he's walking across the water. And pretty soon, he, there's a, the storm just kind of, raises up a little bit wind blows a little harder the waves are coming up a little higher guess who that is that's good old derailer there and he took his eyes off of jesus and starts to look at the storm and immediately he began to sink and he cries out now he's smart enough to know where his help is lord help me i'm dying i'm drowning and the lord reaches out and picks him up and says you know what happened to your faith What Jesus is really saying is, your faith has to have action to it. And so understand, there is a thing, now this is a, a Mark original. So if you publish it in a book or something, and you don't say, I heard this from Pastor Mark, I'm going to come knocking on your door and say, why aren't you sending me some, some royalties? <laughs> but there is a thing called the faith trust continuum. Faith without works is dead. I know James said that and a lot of theologians criticize that because, you know, uh, even the writer of James, you know, talks about the fact that you show me your, your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. But faith without works is dead. In other words, when Jesus says do something, it means to take the steps of faith regardless of what the circumstances might look like. That's why I love what Peter did, because Peter turned his faith into trust. And he took the step. He stepped out of the boat uh, in, in what he knew, you know, logically, you can't walk on water. But here's Jesus walking on us. So, Lord, if you can do it, you can bid me to do it. And so Peter hops out. He turned his faith into trust. So here's the part that I, I kind of copyrighted, or I didn't copyrighted it, but I, I kind of copyrighted it. So, you know, like I said, if you publish it, expect, where's my royalties? Anyway, faith, or excuse me, trust is faith with its, with its gym shoes on. In other words, if God told you something and you take that step, you put your gym shoes on and you're going to exercise your faith by taking the steps of what God has told you to do. All the people that did great things throughout God's word had that faith trust thing going. When the God said it, they did it. And they went out on faith and great things happened because they took the steps of faith. Jesus is saying, Peter, you did it. You stepped out. You defied all logic and reality. You did what I told you you could do. You stepped out on faith. Yet when the challenge of the storm rose up, his faith decreased. His trust went away. And the takeaway for us is this. Have bold faith in Christ and be willing to do whatever he tells you to do. 
in the circumstance. Why? Because it's him that said it, but also know this, Jesus sees the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. So he knows what's down the road in your life. He knows what's over the hills and through the river and around the woods to grandmother's house. He knows all of that stuff. The stuff that you may not see for 10 years ahead of you, Jesus already knows about it. And so when he says, take this step of faith, he is navigating you on a path that will get you to what he's pointed you to in the first place. And every step of faith you take and turn it into trust, he takes you further down that road as you go. But count on the fact that there's going to be storms along the way, but just keep trusting Jesus and what he told you to do. Folks, we have enemies of our soul. Not only the devil, but all those fallen angels that went with him. We call them demons. They are real. And they're a lot like you see on television with all these crazy movies and this dark stuff you see going on. They're far worse than that. But it's not like they also come down the street. You know, the devil doesn't come at you like a, you know, a guy with a big flag and a marching band behind you. you know, It's not like that. I'm the devil and I'm here to tempt you. No, he sneaks in through these derailers. And they just kind of distract you, you know, or devastate you with something, you know, and do all of this stuff. And if he, you know, if he came like a marching band, we'd be ready to fight him. But folks, you have to be ready in the spirit to fight him because know that as you take those steps of faith, you're pleasing Christ and he's with you. And as you take those bold steps of faith, you're getting down the road to where Jesus is trying to take you. And so we have to be determined in our faith that even when the circumstances get almost impossible from our perspective, there's nothing that's too hard for God. And he's going to see you through. Why? Because he's called you to something special. And he's going to take you there. And that's just a part of the app. So we've got this marvelous app for life's problems and burdens and derailers and all of that. The first feature that we talked about is the presence of Jesus. Jesus in the midst. The second feature is the strength of our faith. But the third feature, the one that is, is the greatest blessing to me. And as a matter of fact, when I reached this understanding in my own life, it, it helped me to create my motto for life. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. But Peter was doing just fine walking on the storms as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus and focused on Jesus. It didn't matter what the storm was doing. When the storm increased, he took his attention off of Jesus and placed it on the storm, and it left him feeling devastated and fearful that he would die. But Jesus rescued him. And I know that the temptation is to be hard on Peter because of his lack of faith in this situation. But look, if you look a little further in the scripture, you'll see that Jesus, Peter walked on the water again to get back in the boat. Jesus didn't carry him. Peter walked back with Jesus to get in the boat again because the storm was still raging, but Peter had that connection with Jesus and he walked on the storm to get back in the boat and then Jesus calmed the water. But It was still raging when he was walking again. So Jesus rescued him, but Peter walked on the water again to get back in the boat. And it was only then that the storm calmed down, but it cuts right to my motto in life. My motto in life is this, that regardless of where I am, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what happens to me or anything or anyone around me, I am determined to keep my eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. I adore him. I honor him. I bless his name. I worship him. I give him glory and honor because he is the Lord of my life. He saved me and he lives within me through the presence of the Holy Spirit and he is Lord of my life and I adore him. Folks, we have a lot of choices of how we process stuff that happens to us and what we do with them as we try to go forward through them and after them. But Peter had the right answer. He put his eyes back back on Jesus, and he just kept stepping with the Lord. He literally walked across the storms that were beating against him. So my motto in life, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep stepping because he will enable you to walk on the storms that beat against you. I have that as my motto. I live that daily. Keep my eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. Life's like that, folks. It challenges us. So if we don't keep our eyes on Jesus and keep stepping, 
we will sink in the storm. Sometimes we have to walk a while in the storm, but the assurance is that Jesus walks with us because he's in the midst. We have to have those steps of faith and trust to keep stepping with him because eventually he's going to bring us back into the boat of calmness when we get past this whole circumstance. When he got back into the boat, the calm settled down, and they acknowledged that he was the Son of God, and all of a sudden, their rigors turned into rejoicing. They were able to praise God because they saw that God was there, and he was in control. But more importantly, they saw that with God in control, their lives were going to fulfill the purpose that he had in them in the first place. Folks, I encourage you to do that. Everything you're going through, Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. When sickness comes your way, there's an app for that. Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. When your money gets funny, when your job or your career might hit an impasse, when your relationships might go through hardships or pain or breakage, keep your eyes on Jesus and just keep stepping. Tough times come and your hopes get hindered, keep your eyes on Jesus. When your help seems like it will never come, when your desires get trampled on, when your children and grandchildren are hurting, keep your eyes on Jesus and just keep stepping. When things at church seem to be out of sync, what do you mean they want to install a trampoline in the, in the sanctuary and have kids jumping up and down? What is wrong with this crazy pastor of ours? Now, Pastor Aaron's not going to do that. So. But when things get crazy and it seems like we just, for whatever reason, are stuck here, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. When you don't know what to do, and that's often in life. Sometimes you just don't have the answers. Amazing things happen. When you're determined to take the steps of faith with your eyes on Jesus, the answers come your way. He will enable you to literally walk on the storms that beat against you. He will calm the storms around you when it's time for him to do so. But just keep stepping. All through the process, let your gaze be upon him, and the strength of your steps will be a sign of your adoration of him. Now, I'm realistic enough and to know, and I've been through enough to know, there are some days you wake up, and, and you're thinking about this keep your eyes on Jesus thing and keep stepping, you know? And there are some days you say, I don't have a step in me. Folks, push a toenail out there. And just push it out there. Force yourself to push a toenail out there. And then determine to push the other one out there to come to meet it. And then say, you know, I, I could push a toenail out. It wasn't easy, but I did it. Push the whole toe out there. And just keep stepping. Push toenail, push toe, push ball of your foot, push instep, push heel until you get a whole step out there. Once you've conquered that, just keep stepping with your eyes on Jesus, and he will cause you to walk on the storms that beat against you. And your steps of faith will fuel your praise and your worship and your adoration of Jesus. There's no storm that's going to be able to overcome the child of God who is willing to keep his or her eyes on Jesus and just keep stepping. I love King David. The Psalms just just bless me. One of my favorites, Psalm 34, because here's David, and I'm, I'm about to close. Okay, that, That's black preacher warning that you got another 20 minutes. I'm just kidding. It'd be much shorter than that. But here's King David. He's running from Saul, King Saul, who's trying to kill him because Saul knows that David's going to become the king of Israel. And so David is running, and so he's in the land of the Philistines now. And you need to know that in the land of the these are the folks that Jesus has defeated their warrior. He's defeated Goliath, and there was other times that he's defeated bunches of Philistines with their armies, and the, the Israelites are singing songs that, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. You know, so this is this exalted guy. But now he's running for his life, and in the middle of this running... 
David finds himself in the lands of the Philistines. They say, wait a minute, these folks want to kill me. And so he begins to act like a crazy man. He's foaming at the mouth and doing all of this. And Abimelech, who is the leader of the Philistines, says, wait a minute, I don't have any time for crazy people around me. Get that guy out of here. And so in the middle of all of that, as David is playing like a crazy man, listen at how he's taking these steps of faith and honoring the Lord because God called him to be king. He was anointed to be the king. Listen to what David says. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually make uh, shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. By the way, this is out of the King James Version. There are just some passages that you just need to read out of the King James Version because they sound better. As a matter of fact, you almost need to do your, your James Earl Jones voice. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise. So David is praying this. He says, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about those that fear him and delivereth him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Folks, I encourage you. Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. David comes towards the end of that psalm and he says something that just blesses me. Because there was a dear lady at our church in Ohio, her name was Bernice Burke. And that passage of scripture, verse 19, became her life verse because she fell down her basement steps and broke her neck. And she was incapacitated for a long time. And eventually she made it back to church, but she was in a wheelchair. Uh, but her life verse that she developed during that time, she wasn't discouraged by it all. But her life verse, I said, Sister Bernice, how you doing? She said, oh, Brother Mark, I am fine. I have discovered that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Wow. Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep stepping. And he'll cause you to walk upon the storms that beat against you. So don't allow whatever it is, no matter how difficult, to draw your attention away from Jesus. The devil wants you to walk away from Jesus so he can defeat you. Eyes on Jesus and keep stepping and he will empower you. To walk on the storms that beat against you. Amen? Amen? Bow your heads with me if you would. Our Father and our God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, for so much that you have done in our lives. Saved so many of us, Lord. I can't assume that everybody here knows Jesus as Savior and Lord. But it's certainly my prayer that everyone will. And that they will be filled with your Holy Spirit and walk with you and serve you, Lord God, with the gifts and the call that you have on their lives. That you put in them before they were formed in their mother's womb. But Lord, I'm praying that every single one of us, with whatever's going on in life right now or whatever may come down the road, that all of us, Lord God, would know that there's an app for that. That you're in the midst, Lord Jesus. And that you have a plan and a purpose that will not be thwarted. Also, Lord, that we need to take the bold steps of faith. And that the way we honor you is to adore you by trusting you to walk us through the storm. Bless your people, Lord God. Each and every one, bless every family that's represented here. Even those who don't live here, bless them, Lord. Bless those that might be watching online today and their families. Bless their homes. Bless their communities. Bless this church and this community. And Lord, give them a, a reach, a grasp much farther than even they think their reach is. But Lord, let them continue to turn this community upside down for Christ and be there to encourage people that whatever they're going through in life, there is an app for that. It's Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Have your way in Jesus' precious name. We thank you and pray.